What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Ground Podcast, and today I'm going to be analyzing education, both at the K-12 through level as well as uh, at the higher education level. Um, so first and foremost, the reason why understanding and analyzing and improving education is so important is not just that it has secondary economic benefits. Um, obviously, the more educated the more skillful, I should say, and you get become skillful partially through education, partially through trial and error and just general learning. But the more skills we have, the more we can do, the more the uh, that increases our creative and productive capacity. And that allows us to actually produce more specifically within the marketplace as well as outside of that. And that enriches society generally. Um, obviously, there's a lot more we you could go into in terms of what is good about education but you don't really have to obviously everyone thinks that our education system should be better and I think most people will agree on the ways in which it should be better and I'm gonna go through those in this video um, regardless of the political issue at hand you want to have metrics for success you want to have a way of measuring what we're doing in order to determine whether or not policy is improving the situation uh, hurting the situation or it has had no effect at all um, and obviously you want to consider previous trends before you just consider what's been happening within a certain time frame. If something's been going down 2% a year for 30 years and you're like, in the last 10 years, we've gone down 2% a year because of this policy in the last 10 years. It's crap and it hasn't done anything. Or if it has had some effect and it's gone, it's only gone down by 1% a year, well, then you know, you know, obviously it worked to the opposite. If going down is good, then that would be bad. If it's a murder rate, you want it going down at least 2%, not 1%, but preferably more. Um, <clears throat> so, the first and most obvious of these metrics is our global ranking in education in all the different categories uh, compared to other countries in the world. If we increase our place in those categories relative to those other countries while they're either staying the same or improving their own standards, or if we are simply um, I mean, obviously that, that's one thing, but if we're just increasing our education in and of itself, regardless of the global rankings, that's important too. But measuring that is, is tricky and difficult. We actually don't have good metrics for determining at which rate, or we don't have good metrics for determining quality of education. It's very, very, you can measure it economically, but that's not necessarily teaching. Like teach, being a good teacher doesn't mean that your students make more money necessarily maybe that is a byproduct of better teachers so maybe I'm drawing a, a line there where it shouldn't be but obviously teaching is more than just how much money your students make and how much money they make has a lot to do with the ec the economy the environment their own talents and capacities so so to that end if we're gonna measure what schools and teachers can do for our students we need to consider the differences amongst the student body uh, when we're analyzing these metrics. So what are some of those differences? Uh, the obvious one is intelligence. Everyone knows that they're smart, quote unquote, because I don't like this categorization, that they're smart kids, normal kids, and stupid kids. Uh, we don't like to say it that way. Um, and then obviously there's different kinds of uh, stupid. I, you know, it's a bad word, sort of, but um, there's, there's just unintelligent and then there's having some sort of mental incapacity and that is obviously a spectrum in and of itself, but we do have this, these basic three categories from our education system. We have the advanced class, we have normal kids, and then we have the special needs or, or sub uh, uh, substandard, you know, educational uh, substandard perf substandard performing students. Um, but obviously, that's not reflective of reality. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't smarter and dumber students, but what I am saying is that individual students are going to vary along IQ, and then other personality traits like conscientiousness, which is essentially discipline, are going to heavily affect how they perform in school. Not just at school, but also when it comes to note taking and test taking and things like that. If they're they're more disciplined there as well as outside of there for studying, they'll be better prepared for tests. But also at home. If you're a more disciplined person in your environment, like regardless of the environment at home, if you're a more disciplined person naturally, and discipline can be 
developed in a person. It's not just what you're given, but a part of it na is naturally occurring. Where you are on the human spectrum can be changed slightly by behavior, but you're not going to go from the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile uh, in all likelihood ever, but definitely not without serious pain. Um, so <clears throat> you need to analyze those two differences, just intelligence and conscientiousness, um, and I think those will be good enough for measuring individual students' progress, because if despite their intelligence and your education, or sorry, despite their intelligence and their conscientiousness, if you can still accelerate the rate of which the rate at which they're becoming educated and learning relative to a different teacher who had that same student, then you're obviously showing that you can actually teach better than that. And that operates on the school level as well as the teaching level. So we need to correct all of that data for the IQ of the individual students and the conscientiousness level of the individual students, as well as any other metrics that are scientifically based that uh, would relate to that. Uh, and that'll allow us to manage the independent variables and then assess uh, educational, the acceleration of education. We'll uh, be able to measure that more accurately. <clears throat> so um, any education system that we create has to be in tune with reality. And so it can't be based off of uh, the smart kids, the regular kids and the dumb kids. It, it can't be based off of that, that caste system because the reality is that human beings, based off of their their uh, birthplace, their opportunities, their environment, their family, their own biology, their personalities, their natural interests and inclinations, their intelligence level, um, and a variety of other things, like literally almost a limitless number of other things influence individuals, as well as their own choices and thoughts and, and values, especially their values. All those things affect people's uh, lives and their and their individual circumstances and their ability to if you measure like it's a kind of a funny phrase uh but it's an accurate one everyone is equal until you start measuring them i don't know if anyone said that or if i said that or what but it's been said i'm sure everyone is equal until you start measuring them whether it's height strength bench pressing cup size you know penis size <laughs> whatever it is um obviously humans vary you know humans vary in their ability to compete in basketball humans vary in their ability to compete in a variety in every single domain essentially every single domain where you start measuring human performance hierarchies show up because individually we all have our own unique capacity um so our education system needs to be reflective of that and <clears throat> The best place to start for reforming our education system, we're going to start with K through 12, then I'm going to move on to higher education. The first place to start with fixing our education system would be the funding of our education system. So, uh, and, and I don't mean, so I believe all taxes should be collapsed into an income tax. And if you want to watch my video, Rethinking Taxes, you'll uh, get deeper analysis on that. Um, because I essentially, because if you cut out regressive taxes, you're left with flat or progressive, and those can only really be managed by a consumption tax or by, in the case of a flat tax, sort of you can get a, a, a con, you can use a consumption tax to achieve a flat tax or income taxes. So having non-income taxes is uh, almost generally a, a reason for it to be um, for us to get rid of those taxes. <clears throat> and. <clears throat> When it comes to the funding mechanism for our education system, uh, outside of uh, things like the lotto, and outside, I mean, it doesn't affect the distribution of it. The lotto in California is complicated, but, and states and federal governments can actually also uh, assist when it comes to the funding of schools, so they can influence the way they work to a certain degree, um, which can be good or bad, depending on what they're doing, and, um, it is what it is, but at the local level, the primary way in which most schools are funded is through property taxes. So what that, what that means is that where property taxes are higher per person, meaning the property values are higher per person, students get more money per student. And where property values are lower in poorer communities, 
per person, then per kid you get less money. So we have a system currently that is not just being funded mainly through a regressive tax, which, which is its own problem, but it's also giving the most funding per kid to the rich communities and giving the least funding per kid to poor communities, which at a bare minimum is completely backwards. Obviously poor people and poor communities need the most educational assistance and the people in the richer communities are going to have the most educated parents on average. So it's a totally backward system. But that doesn't mean I believe we should reverse it. I don't think that uh, students that are in poor communities necessarily should get more funding and kids in richer communities should get less. Um, the only reason why, so I'm going to overlap poor academic performance with poverty because there is a correlation there, not because poor people are dumb, but because intelligence affects how much money you can make. So it's, it's, there's, there's an overlap here between, between all these things. But, <clears throat> um, if you paid schools or teachers more for the underperforming students that they have, um, you will most likely only encourage more uh, of those worst performing. If it's worst performing students that give you more money, then teachers will actually work to produce worse students so that they get more money and can pocket it. So there's a danger with this being abused if we if we if we uh, still violate equality under the law with our funding mechanism. I don't believe in doing that. So what I would propose is switching to a, a, a dead even system where every single student gets funded with the exact same amount of money, whether they're in a, whether they're in a rich community or a poor community. Uh, and that's in terms of the government funding of those programs. When it comes to private donations, you can't help that. If a rich community is going to have someone donate a brand new football field, there's no correcting for that. It is what it is. Um, ideally, people that are rich that make it out of bad neighborhoods will go back and help. But that's not always the case, um, and we can't control for that. And it is what it is. Um, you can't you can't ultimately fix inequality in the world. It's just built into reality. Like I said, we're all equal in ultimate value, but we're all equal until you start measuring us. Then we're all different. Excuse me. So we need to change our uh, our uh, educational funding system so that all students get the exact same funding. Uh, so they have an even playing field. Um, but there's also side uh, benefits to that, <clears throat> which I'm going to get into. Um, and that it has to do with the structure of public education or the structure of our K-12 through system. So one of the major problems with uh, our discussion about education right now is that some people think that funding is the only issue at hand. If you think funding is the only issue at hand, then you believe that structurally there's nothing wrong with the way they're spending the money right now, which is, which is not the case. Like if, if there is a, first off, there is an issue with the structure, but if there's a problem in the education system and it's structural, if you add money to the, to the, if you add resources to the organization, the structure that is wasting money will only waste more money as it gets more money pumped into it. But if a system is actually using the money appropriately, then more funding is actually better. So it's 100% dependent on the structure and the funding is almost a side issue. Although more, although again, if you have a good education system, funding it better and giving it more resources is most likely going to be better um, to a point. At some point you'll be sufficient in your funding and so increasing funding won't lead to better outcomes, which is really the only metric that we should use for justifying increasing uh, our funding of education. So, um, yeah, so we need to not just consider the amount of money we're spending, but also the structure of the organizations and the structure of the policies and the regulations around the education system. <clears throat> so first and foremost, when it comes to the faults in our current structure with uh Aside from the funding mechanisms, uh, the current primary issue with the structure in our education system is, uh, first and foremost, that in, in many cases, the 
the actual presiding government body that is in charge of the school at the local level is actually not the local elected representatives, but it's actually a school government in and of itself. To me, it seems insane to not have the education system be under the purview and the uh, management and the uh, guidance of the local elected officials. It seems like the most obvious way to change the underlying policies to improve education is to is to have them under that purview. So structurally, we should have one big government system and the local elected officials have to be able to hold the student uh, or the school system accountable. Um, now, I actually believe in... So I actually believe in getting rid of the school government mechanism because we're going to be funding it a different way anyways but also if there's additional structures the the uh management if you change if you create a good structure for our education system the management that will be required from the government will be minimal it still it still should be under the purview of elected officials but if the structure itself is okay there shouldn't be a whole lot of sort of checking in and micromanaging that's necessary um, and you'll understand why um, another issue fundamental issue with our education system is the structure of teachers pay um, so first off a lot of people say I, I wish teachers would make more and that you know I wish puppies lived longer I wish they stayed t tiny and cute till the end of time I'm, I'm not making fun of the sentiment you're coming from a good place but just saying I want this to happen is too simple, not nuanced enough, and it creates lots of problems. First and foremost, you got to consider the gap between total government spending on, on education and then the gap between that and total compensation of teachers. Now, I haven't looked this up in my notes. It, it, it's deep, deep, deep into my notes, and I just didn't want to take the time to look it up. I encourage you to look it up, but um, I think the average pay of teachers equates to something like half of our total uh, spending on education. And um, the proposal that I have for switching the education system will improve teacher pay dramatically, but um, one of the major issues that we have is the gap between sort of teacher's pay and total education spending, and that's expenses. Um, administrative costs and just fat in the system as well wasted spending uh, makes up that gap um, because obviously you know once you buy a classroom and you have the materials which are dirt cheap and you have the teacher the teacher is pretty much the next major expense so obviously most of the money should be going to teachers um, but right now it's not no. in a lot of cases a lot of money is actually going to bad teachers as well as the administrator so if you make it impossible through teachers unions and things like that and uh, I'll get to teachers unions in a minute but if you make it impossible through teachers unions influence and, and effect on the regulations if you make it impossible to fire a teacher in a public teaching union then that means that it might actually be more cost effective year to year with their budget it's not long term but year to year it might be more cost effective to just keep paying that person and have them not teach then to fire them and go through the legal process of firing them and all the severance package costs and all that. So, ironically, we and, and, and so we actually have a huge issue where we're paying tons of teachers to do nothing and to not actually teach. This is mainly a problem in New York, but this is a problem in, in other districts as well across the United States. So that's one problem with, with teachers pay is some teachers are getting paid to not teach. That's a problem. Um, and then the final thing with the, the issue that's the, with the structure of teacher's pay, sorry, the final issue is that all teachers, regardless of their performance, as long as they don't get fired, get paid the exact same way and get pay increases every single year that they're out of school, again, if they don't get fired, until they hit some sort of a max. So there's no incentive beyond the love of the job to actually outperform your other teachers and there's no way to reward better teachers and there's no way to punish teachers that are doing badly or to fire and get rid of or underpay teachers that are simply offering less value you know 
that one of the benefits to the school that I went to my junior and part of my senior year in high school was that on campus they had teacher they had a full staff of teachers and then they had a supportive staff of tutors that could get paid less money because they had to be less educated but they still could be just as savvy or good at teaching someone in a specific area, math or history or whatever, um, so that they were extremely useful to us as students when we got there and we got to, to um, if we needed the additional help, we had those tutors as supplement, supplementary staff. And instead of paying these people that are doing nothing to teach, we could spend less money uh, on those, instead of those crappy teachers, we can actually, um, just use money on tutors and still get the, the, the added benefit of that additional teaching staff, but they're actually uh, not, they don't cost us as much and they're not, they're probably long or uh, short term, probably short term uh, employees, not necessarily long term, although they might become a teacher, who knows. But um, we need to change it so that the competence and the capacity of the teacher in, as it goes up. And as they are better than the other teachers, their pay goes up as well. <clears throat> um, another structural issue with our education system is the pace of our education. Uh, again, it flies in the face of, of the recognition that human beings are individuals that vary along all sorts of dimensions. To expect all students to just learn every single day the exact same material in this little 50 minute slot, the exact same material in this little 50 minute slot, and the exact same material over the course of this seven hour day, five days a week, 180 days a year, for 13 years. It's insane that we have as much success in education as we do with this model. The only reason why it works is because human, being, uh, human beings' personality traits and intelligence levels uh, follow a standard distribution, which just means that the bulk is in the average, and as you get further away from the average, people are more and more rare. So, there's a lot more average people, and rare people are rare, from a personality and intelligence perspective. Um, so, having that uniform pace of education makes no sense whatsoever. Um, each student should be following their own math acceleration, their own English you know, uh, acceleration and etc. Because some people will be more talented at one, one aspect. They might be a math person, but they might not be as good at English or the reverse. They might not, they might like English more, but they're not as good at math. If you're really good at one area and you can go fast and blaze through it and your freshman year, you finished all four years of your high school requirements, then you have the remaining three years to focus on everything else that's more difficult and will take more time for you to learn anyway. So we need to make it so that individuals can follow their own individual course of education. And what this will translate to is that the more effort you put in, the more progress you make, and the less effort you put in, the less progress you make relative to your own situation. You're not being, you're not being measured against other people uh, directly, you're getting basically mainly you're being measured against yourself and how fast you can improve your own learning. And as you learn to learn, like as you uh, as you learn various things, your actual ability to learn generally improves. And if we have that improving from an early age, and at, for example, at the age of ten, you're actually putting your full effort and know what your full effort and full capacity is and you're getting after it in order to develop yourself as much as possible, by the time you're 25, you're gonna be a formidable human being. Whereas if you don't start that process ever, or it gets started at the age of 17, as you're approaching adulthood, you're gonna be uh, worse off. It's not, it's not gonna work out for you. So we wanna encourage the people to uh, go at their own pace, but push their own pace as well. <clears throat> uh, Oh, uh, I, I kind of said this already, but not every student is going to require the same amount of time on campus. I personally, when I was going to that charter school I mentioned earlier, it was a charter school, um, I went there four hours a week, uh, and I was graduating at three times the pace of a normal high school, because that's once, once I was just allowed to do things in, like... Once the reins were off and the, stru and the regimented structure was pulled off of me, not only could I outperform academically um, 
it was going at three times the pace of a normal school. But around the same period, I started doing all of my own personal research and um, studying uh, online, just trying to learn about the world, weightlifting and other things. But that, that the tools that I established and how I learned those things have carried over into how I learn about all sorts of things today. Um, so I benefited from having to spend, or in my opinion, waste so much of my time at school. I benefited from being able to cut that down and then spend my time. I wasted a lot of time. I'm not going to, I don't want anyone to think that I was this amazing uh, mark of discipline at age 15. I'm not now. I'm not anything remotely close to discipline now. I'm just, I'm doing my best. But uh, definitely not at age 15 or 16. But, but because I had so much extra time, it allowed for the fun to be done and then also for that additional work and uh, digging and studying and my natural interests, it allowed them to flourish under that uh, scenario. So having a universal time requirement for all students at school not only doesn't work in, in all sorts of ways, but it actually robs both the, hot, the uh, students that require less time of what they could do with the rest of their time and it also robs the people who need more time to learn these things of getting that time and that focus because if you pull certain students who need less attention out of the equation whatever teaching staff you have can pull those limited resources and focus them more on those remaining students so and those remaining students can get more time so it just it just makes sense to change things up in this way so the actual program that ties all of these def different changes together is a voucher system where we just have one pool of money. It gets chopped up between all of the various students in the student body. And um, their parents, their guardians, determine where they go to school. So this is where I, I kind of tie things back into why we're talking about education in the first place. I, I, I'm glad I kind of didn't mention this at the beginning. The purpose of uh, having government pay for education, public education, in part is to make sure that every single student and every single individual gets the benefits and the choice of private school, with, even if they don't have the even if they don't have the money to afford it. It's, it's about creating the, in a certain sense, creating equality of opportunity, but I don't believe that that's actually achievable. I believe that um, we need to stick to equality under the law, but I'm all for maximizing opportunity and maximizing outcome. And max, one of the aspects of maximizing opportunity is making it so that every single student gets this fundamental educational opportunity and that just because you're poor, doesn't mean that your ability to become educated should be stifled or limited just because you lack that opportunity. It's, it's a social good. We sort of agreed to it. I don't want to get bogged down into the philosophy of it. It's not changing, obviously, uh, at the public K-12 through level. So best that we fix the system as opposed to complain that it exists. It's, it's not changing, and I don't think it should change in the sense that we have government spending on education uh, for minors, which I'll explain in a minute. But there's a few different problems that people bring up when the, the voucher system comes up. Um, uh, teachers pay sometimes is one of them. And th the fact is if you have say 10 grand per student going uh, through the voucher system, then if one teacher that's really good or a group of five teachers that's really good, if they just create their own little school, they can have, we'll say one, one teacher for every 10 students, and you have five teachers in five subjects. So 50 students, 10 grand per student, that's $500,000 a year. That's 100 grand per teacher for them to have for their classes, and they're only teaching 10, either 10 kids per subject at a time, or if it's just one teacher and 10 kids, 10 kids all the time on all subjects but they get all that money they can get all that money themselves so the teachers pay issue has helped tremendously with the voucher system and one of the benefits of the voucher system so parents choose on a either monthly basis or an annual basis 
where their kid goes, the money gets sent to that school, and then they can pull that kid from that school at any time that they want, and then the money can get redirected to whatever school they put that kid into afterwards. The benefit of that is that it gives teachers the ability to say, screw you to a bad school, we're gonna go elsewhere and look for better services. Um, it also allows this decentralized consumer, uh, this uh, consumer decentralized network to operate in order to give us, uh, since prices will be uniform with the voucher system, it'll just mean increases or decreases in quality, we'll learn about and people will learn and hear about good school, bad school. And the people that do the research will be able to educate their fellows on that. Um, so, um, that's a so that's a benefit also it will allow because you're not going to have standards for what the you can have standards that are habitual meaning a student has to exercise for an hour a day a student has to read for an hour a day i think those kinds of things are important but beyond that the actual criteria or curriculum or anything like that i think that should be left to the producers of the education meaning the businesses schools or teachers um so I want a decentralized network or decentralized system for that as well. And this voucher system essentially fixes the issue for poor people, which is they don't have the resources to pay for education. We give them that those resources, then it's still up to them to make all those same decisions. And all the benefits of the market and competitive based system, free market system are at play, even though we have this centralized government agency or program but it's structured in a decentralized equality under the law way which means that policies generally can be structured that way and they can work by fixing the issue that government can solve which is redirecting resources and it fix the and the, but it does not interfere with the good aspects of a competitive free and dynamic market so it's the best of both worlds it's a hybrid um, capitalist government system. <clears throat> so, um, one of the objections that people will make to the voucher system is that uh, not just the teacher thing, but also uh, that religious schools will now be getting government money. <clears throat> um, and then they'll be like, blah, 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 church and state separation. <laughs> but a, a rich person with money has the choice to send their kid to a religious private school or to not do that. If you believe that poor people do not deserve that same ability to choose where their kid goes to school, you're either an anti-religious zealot or bigot, or you're an anti-poor person bigot and you don't think that they're capable of making that decision for their child themselves. And again, the decision is just good school, bad school, is my student doing well or not? It's not this giant sophisticated, the curriculum of third grade history should be blah, blah, blah. You might think you're an expert on that. So you'll be like, well, the standard should be this and the government should mandate that. I don't think I'm that smart. I actually think that the collective genius of the entire American people is a little bit greater than mine. So I think that we should actually leverage that when we're creating a system. Um, and if you have a problem with religious schools getting money, uh, if they're teaching the kids better, why do you care? It's because you hate religious people. Or, I mean, I understand you can also have fears about religious influence in schools, but, th but then again, you're just anti-religious. You're just saying that people learning about religion or even being uh, evangelized while they're at school by other religious people that that is in some way immoral and that's life that that happens in life and the education and the religion should not be dictated by government it should be individuals making that decision it should not be government standards that that lock out religious education because locking out religious education is a form of religious prejudice just as much as supporting a particular type of religion would be just as well would be anyways so, there's no problem if money in the system goes to religious schools. If you think poor parents are less capable of making those decisions, I think you're uh, prejudiced against poor people, and I think you should reconsider, reconsider your thoughts and your position. From age 16 to 18 years old, I believe that the student should have the choice of where they go to school. So, the final 24 months of education, 
they should be able to determine this. So that means that if they wanna to go to a specialized medical school or an engineering school or a trade school or a tech school or whatever it may be, they will have that choice at age 16 so that they can go and follow the career that they want. You know, if you have uh, someone who wants to be an engineer or someone who wants to be a doctor and they have known that since age 12, but you have our current system which will have them building their resume until they're 18 to get into a college to build that resume to ultimately go to a medical school and then by the time they're 33 21 years later they're actually working as a doctor if we started that process where they're already because they're working that whole time they're just working to build a fluff resume in order to appease a school to get into the program it has nothing to do with their capacity at the beginning of this whole thing if we can start them on that program at a young age, we will actually produce all kinds of talented workers at a much younger age and get a lot longer lifespans out of them. They'll have a lot more wealth over the course of their lives as a result, a lot less debt because of the education up front. Like, there's all sorts of benefits. So, uh, having a, a system where you can have all these specialized types of schools anyways this doesn't have to be for the 16 to 18 deal you can have engineering schools that you go to from the age of 10 or 12 or 8 or whatever you want um and if you have a special needs kid you know we should have schools that are designed for special needs uh kids because they need spe they need specialization they need special talents and the best we can offer those kids in particular the better because they they deserve to be taken care of they deserve to be to be made to be able to function healthily and socially as much as humanly possible and just however we can help them we can we should so i like the voucher system for that reason too it'll create that specialization for all sorts of different types of people but most importantly the people that are hurting the most um so yeah so the, the voucher system is the way to go um but i actually believe so <clears throat> i want to talk a little bit about pre-k and kindergarten Right now our current system is K through 12 and then some places offer pre-K, some don't. Um, and that's age five roughly, normally age five to 18, 13 years of education. Um, if it's good or bad education, then that in and of itself with the system is what matters and the amount of years isn't necessarily as relevant, but um, what a lot of people don't know <clears throat> is that what determines your socialization level in the world, meaning as an adult, how well do you fit into society versus not? What is your likelihood of criminality? What is your likelihood of violence towards other people, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? What makes for a good citizen? What is one of the biggest factors for spe uh, specifically for students and for young people? is what how much time they have socializing and interacting with other people and other kids their age between the ages of 24 months and 48 months or two to four years old within that time frame if they interact with lots of other kids and develop social skills then um they'll be much more of a of a positive and harmless fit into society as a result and will be a much better citizen as a result if they don't get that then they're gonna be awkward around other kids and other adults and they're gonna be uh, an outcast and they're gonna be more likely to lash out in bad ways violent ways with the world because they didn't learn well because they didn't learn um at that critical period how to play in the good way, how to play uh, with other people in a in a good sports kind of way, a good sportsman kind of way. Um, so that socialization from the age of two to four is extremely critical. So I believe 100% in extending the, our K through 12 programs to age 24 months to 18 years old, and I would like it all to be a voucher system so that whether it's daycare, pre-K, or whatever teachers have uh or sorry not teachers parents have all of the same choices uh that rich parents have for their kids so that they can really give them the best shot at life um so we need it to extend it from age two to age 18 and we need a voucher system 
And for all sorts of reasons, that's going to be the best way to go. Okay, so on to higher education. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, I want to talk about the student loan crisis. So, tuition has gone up over the last few decades relative to standard income uh, quite a bit. This is not at all because the education's gotten better. It's not because government is spending less money on education. It's actually spending more money on education. It's because of uh, a mixture of the government getting involved in controlling the way schools have to operate, uh, which in and of itself will create administrative fat, and the administration has in large part uh, become what adds to the cost of tuition. Uh, but beyond that, uh, what also adds to the cost of tuition is the fact that the normal market mechanisms uh, for an education type of business are all disrupted um, under the current system. So higher education institutions get all of their money up front through the loaning mechanism. They get all their money up front. So however much they educate you or whether or not they actually make you more economically viable on the other side, none of that matters to them because they get their money up front. So they just want to make sure that you pass and they want to, if anything, they actually want to keep you, well, they want to educate you as much as possible or as long as possible because the longer it takes to educate you, the more money they make. So on those two fronts, their incentives are completely backwards. You also cannot default on the loans. So the people providing the money for these types of loans have no risk if you can't actually pay them back because you have no option for bankruptcy. So um, you assume all this debt and all this future cost in exchange for a decision you're making now and they get all their money up front. So <clears throat> they have no incentive to attract you with lower prices because you're not paying it right now, you're paying it over time. They're getting their money up front and someone else is funding it and they know they're gonna get guaranteed interest on the back end because you can't default on the loan. You can't file uh, bankruptcy. So we have had a lot of debt accumulate around education because of all these various issues in higher education and one of the problems with all this mounting debt, especially when interest rates are high, is that that eats into consumption and that eats into the money that people could be spending in the economy, the money that they could be consuming with. And eating into that consumption will eat into the potential growth of the economy. So um, there are economic consequences to having a high student loan uh, burden. Um, <clears throat> They go, even though that interest is getting paid to someone else, uh, the people that are paying off student loans are uh, paying that out of the, they're in their earning years and most of the people that are making money off of this interest either have enough money to begin with or they're old and retired and don't really need the interest all that much where they could find it somewhere else for more money. So, so we have the student loan crisis and it's totally legit and it sucks for the people that get stuck in that system. Um, so, out of that problem, naturally, I think we have one and a half trillion dollars of student debt now, 1.3 trillion maybe, which is uh, the size of Mexico's GDP. That's kind of crazy, actually. Um, the obvious sort of response to this has been to consider student debt forgiveness or paying off people's student loans. Um, I'm not in favor of that for two reasons. One the people that have already paid off their loans are getting screwed because they made the right decisions and, and sacrifices and paid off their debt and now they now other people are getting so they're getting punished in some sense or there's an opportunity cost punishment for them having paid off the student loans in the first place so that is its own problem and then beyond that if you pay off student debt or you make uh, college if you pay off all student debt up until now that's effectively a gigantic subsidy for the college educated class, for the upper class essentially. Not economically, because there's rich people that aren't educated or their education is not relevant to their uh, 
earning, but um, <clears throat> lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> it's effectively a subsidy for the college-educated class for for the upper class, which is insane on its face. You know, it's totally unfair to think that the people that allegedly had this advantage in the economy, which they do, obviously, people that are more educated get jobs that people that aren't educated don't. It makes no sense for this privileged class to get an economic subsidy when everyone else, particularly the poor working class, pays for it. So that's totally backwards and stupid, and I'm totally against that. Um, but there are other equality under the law. There are other more neutral ways of resolving the student debt crisis um, that has nothing to do with that and uh, that adheres to equality under the law. One of the ways that you could do it, and it's not exactly equality under the law, but it's not as much of a direct violation of it, would be to freeze interest rates as uh, Trump has done, and uh, lots of people have talked about this, but Trump, Trump did it via executive order, and I think they did it via uh, the CARES Act previously. Uh, freezing the interest rates and the interest payments on student debt, which will allow people to make principal payments uh, and pay that debt down. Now that benefits people that have the money to pay that debt down now, as opposed to the people that have to do it over time anyways, but that's at least one potential mechanism that we can use to help pay down that debt and make it the make the debt service cost uh, decrease relative to that. Now, um, the other way we could do it is with the UBI or universal basic income or the stimulus payments to all American adults. If you have this mechanism where you're putting out money that in a way that is not discriminating between any uh, American citizen, except in this case, insofar as it has to be an adult American citizen, um, that adheres to equality under the law. It helps all people equally and it will allow people to pay down this debt should they choose to use that money for those things. So I'm all for uh, uh, economic stimulus payments or a UBI type of deal. If you want to know more about that, check out my uh, Rethinking Welfare video. Uh, okay. All right. So that, talk, that talks a lot about the structure of higher education. Um, but the fundamental question politically when it comes to higher education is... Uh, and you might have thought that I that I disagreed with this earlier. For K or for age two to eighteen, I'm for a public education system. When you're a minor living under your parents' house, you should um, you should be being educated uh, in a way that goes beyond what your parents can offer you. I'm all for that. Um, oh, I, I don't know if I said this earlier, but I would like to point this out. Uh, someone's someone's. Uh, experience at home, whether it's an abusive situation or, or, or just a chaotic situation or whatever, if you have homework or a certain aspect of academic, of your academic work, if it's reliant on what you can and cannot do at home, that is a problem because people's households are different. So that inequality at home is bleeding into academia. And the whole point is to even out things, correcting for those imbalances at home. So to make it so that the education system is only operating for you, or you're only succeeding if that environment at home is good enough for you to be able to to be able to do the work anyways, um, that creates a problem. So, but the fundamental question when it comes to higher education is: Do we fund it with public funding or not? Again, uh, the H two to eighteen voucher program is different, but once you go beyond that and you get into higher education. Should the government be subsidizing that at all? Well, I have to take the arguments that people put in favor of this one by one, and then I'll, I'll knock them down. First off, people talk about the benefits of college for the experience or the fun. Government taxpayer money should not be used for you to have ex an experience or to have fun or to put off adulthood for another four years so you could go party at a school. I'm not talking smack on the people that do that, but I'm saying government money 
taxpayer money should not be used for those ends. If you want to do that for yourself, that's fine, but that's got to be your decision and you have to bear the, the brunt of the consequences of that. So it shouldn't be used for funding fun or the experience. Economic viability. Lots of people argue that if you are more educated, you make more money over the course of your life. Now there's a, there's a egg, there's a chicken and egg question with that because if you are taking the population that's more educated compared to the population that's less educated and you're saying they make more money, it could be because those individuals are more capable of making money in the first place and therefore they're more academically proficient. It could not, it's possible that it's not the edu education in and of itself that's creating that economic viability. Uh, it might have shown up there anyways in that person. It's just one of the mechanisms through which they've worked that out. But, um, <clears throat> so, uh, oh, um, if it's economically viable to go to college, meaning you're going to make enough money on the other side of that so that it's worth it to go because, because you'll make more money and it'll increase the quality of your life. Um, then it shouldn't require a government subsidy. If it makes economic sense to go to school, then why would we have to subsidize it? If, if you are a student who deserves to go to school and there's a school that wants good students, they should have the money, first off, to be able to loan it to you in the first place, but beyond that, uh, you the education should be of sufficient quality so that the, so that the cost of the education doesn't matter in the end. The fact that our education system has educated so many people and we have this debt crisis shows you that there was a giant lie behind a lot of that stuff. Education is still good, but academia is not the end-all be-all for education, especially trade or vocational education. Um, so it doesn't make any sense to subsidize it for that reason. If you believe that an educated society in and of itself is a good thing therefore spending that money is good or an educated world is good so spending that money is good um we are already spending money and we will be from age 2 to 18 or k through 12. if we don't get the if we don't get the quality education done then why pay for another four to eight years it doesn't make any sense the uh okay so we shouldn't have government subs government money going to higher education whatsoever, except when it comes to medical school for doctors. Now, I believe that there's a lot we can do to make medical education cheaper and more cost effective. But if it's going to be expensive no matter what, and it's going to cost a minimum of, say, a hundred grand no matter what, then I'm 100% in favor of a $100,000 flat grant to all American-born or not American born, sorry, to all American citizens that, it, that finish medical school at one of the various credentialed schools will give you 100 grand um, right there and then there to help pay down that debt. Um, only, and the only reason why I would be in favor of that, even though it's paying for some people's education over others, so it violates equality under the law, healthcare is one of the few sectors where better healthcare actually means lives saved so it transcends normal economic considerations healthcare is still a business goods and services are still goods and services and i'm going to explain all this in a healthcare video but that doesn't mean that healthcare in and of itself is not more valuable than a freaking pair of shoes obviously um so i'm all in favor of subsidizing medical education and i think that grant for finishing medical school is one of the ways in which we can do it outside of cleaning up the bureaucracy but most of the bureaucracy will be cleaned out if we just get the federal government and the government generally out of it let all those schools operate by themselves have to operate like a business and they can own or, or we can lease out or sell you know the properties that they operate on to them or, or whatever um <clears throat> but um yeah, so we need to get money out of uh, higher education. We need to completely revamp and rethink K through 12 or uh, pre-K through 12 uh, education. And um, yeah, that's it. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you liked it, please share. And uh, heads up for the next one. Peace. <laughs>